Thank you for joining today's webinar, Performance-Based Design, the Energy Modeling Process. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Microdesk is an Autodesk Gold, Oracle, and Google partner. We provide technology training and consulting solutions for the AEC industry. We have 12 offices located throughout the East and West Coast, as well as Chicago, and a staff of over 100 consulting and technical specialists. Over the next hour, we are going to review some of the latest technologies and processes that can enable us to conduct complex analysis and test performative design scenarios to create more sustainable buildings. We'll hear straight from a designer who's putting these methodologies into practice and discuss how we can start leveraging available technologies in your own practices today. So for presenting today's session, we have two guests, Microdesk Senior Consultant Peter Marchese and Sean Quinn from architecture firm HOK. Peter specializes in assisting design organizations with implementing building information modeling processes. He works on an ongoing basis with major design firms across the country, including HOK, Perkins Eastman, and KPF. Peter has expert knowledge of BIM technologies such as Revit Architecture, AutoCAD Architecture, Ecotech, Green Building Studio, Google SketchUp, eSpecs, and many more. Now, Sean is Sustainable Design Specialist with HOK. He has over eight years of experience in the architecture field. And as Sustainable Design Specialist, he works to improve the design, planning, and construction of projects through resource management regarding energy, water, and environmental issues. He was recently honored as a member of the winning team of the Metropolis Next Generation Design Competition for their unique Process Zero retrofit design of a GSA building in LA. So just a few logistics here before we begin. In order to minimize any background distractions, you are all on mute for the duration of this session. If you have any questions, though, during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the question area of the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. Uh, Peter and Sean will address as many of those questions as they can at the end of the presentation. If we do run out of time, we will provide you with our contact information, and you can be sure to follow up with us after that, and we'll get right back to you. So with all that, I will now turn it over to Peter and Sean. Good morning, everybody. So thank you very much for joining us. And what we're going to start off with, we have a little agenda. Sean's going to be going over a lot of information regarding sustainability and the performance-based design process. And we're going to be switching back and forth. And I'll be doing some actual software demonstration to give an example of how we might use the tools to actually provide Sean the information that he needs to make these informed decisions. So, Sean, all yours. All righty. All right, I have a little problem with the phone over there. So. Sorry, folks, bear with us just a second. We'll get you the mm -hmm. sound back going here in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Great. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, now we can. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Sean Quinn with uh, HOK. As Laura very well said, I'm a uh, sustainable design specialist with HOK for about two years now. Um, for about 25 years, HOK has been, you know, pretty in-depthly involved with sustainability, realizing it's sort of at a, uh, at a global architecture firm, uh, our reach and our impact on the local environment is pretty vast, and so we've taken on as a responsibility to, to try and address those issues as best as possible through all of our projects, whether they're you know, extremely large master planning projects, uh, base buildings, or down to our own interiors projects. Um, we're one of the early adopters of the Architecture 2030 Challenge, uh, for which I'm responsible of trying to report all the energy model data that, that we put out through all of our projects throughout the world. Uh, go on to the next slide here. Next slide. Great. 
One of the most important things that we've been trying to uh, focus on, oh, I think back one to, to integrated design. One of the things that we've been trying to promote for a long time is that uh, to try and engage early on consultants uh, into the process uh, sooner rather than later. It's far too often that architects uh, move forward with design, send it off to an engineer, get pushed back, and change. And there's actually not a whole lot of uh, hand-holding in that process. And what we really need to do is to engage that process a lot earlier on. And what that ends up being for us longer term is that we're actually being able to put a bit more money uh, in the places where we'd love to see it, in the actual architecture. I mean that architecture has the role to play in the uh, passive energy use of our buildings. Uh, the first objective really is to save energy, not use energy in a more efficient fashion. Let's just plain old use less. Uh, so by bringing on our engineers much, much sooner, we're able to identify the means by which architecture can actually take the place of oversized uh, building e e equipment. And so what that looks at from a, from a cost point of view is a lot more money in architecture and a little bit less in the actual building system. Moving on to the next. What that's going to re require as a result is that we have some architects within, within, within large architecture firms or even small architecture firms that take on a bit more of a responsibility of the energy and environmental impact of every project. Essentially, we want architects to be running some very short analyses, as we're calling them here, sprints. Um, the idea is that in any project, we come up with multiple different ideas, multiple different schemes, and to give that to give those very early on aspects to an engineer means running many different analyses across each of those schemes uh, and taking a bit too much time to get any feedback. So what we really want to do is actually have the architects run those schemes first, really ask the tough questions and try to inform ourselves uh, early on how each of those schemes is going to function against each other. And once we've come up with a refined scheme, that's when we give it to our engineers who are really running the marathon here. Uh, the ones that are going to do that in-depth analysis to drive the design forward. Uh, but we're not be becoming lost in the weeds and brief ideas and sketches. We're actually going to analyze that on our own first. Next. And so what we have called it as a result of that is what we're trying to, sh to really achieve here is performance-based design. Uh, which you know, hopefully is really changing what a building might actually look like. How do you design a building to get uh, daylight into all its spaces? How do you optimize the building's skin to allow for natural ventilation? Reduce the amount of uh, HVAC zoning that may be required for space? And to get rid of sort of edge heating and cooling where you're uh, being exposed to either solar heat gain during the summertime or, uh, or, or, or excessive cooling during the winter. And actually trying to move some of the interior spaces away from that building edge. And ultimately, how do we really try and achieve that, that 2030 goal of a net zero building or a carbon neutral building? Moving on to the next, um, what we really want to do is focus on bringing forward a lot of these studies and, and, and a, a lot of these conversations really early on into schematic design. Uh, it's really at this stage that we have the ability, you know, as we're leading forth with any project, to really ask these questions and understand you know, how some of these gestures are going to impact it. Uh, and at that stage, it's not really going to necessarily impact cost. What we're looking for here is first energy conservation, not using energy in places where we don't need to. Uh, and going on to the next slide, that begins then the opportunity for us to run a series of, of analyses, looking at, you know, how do we actually impact performance uh, through the architectural fashion and, and, and at that stage, we are really saving money in, in the long run, both in terms of how we manage our, our, our own business as well as how that building functions long term. Moving on to the next, what that begins to look like is a series of different analyses uh, that can be run throughout the course of any project. Uh, typically, as we start off any project, whether it's in concept design or even as we're going after a project and through the interview mid phase, is to first start off with uh, what's called energy benchmarking and, and targeting. Understanding how much energy a office building uses in that area, or a school, or a hospital. And what's a realistic target based on the RFP that we've received or the client's goals in order to uh, reduce energy here. The next thing is to really look at the uh, climate. Understand, obviously, that 
uh, within a global architecture firm and with a very changing world and and the, and the economy. A lot of us work in places that we've you know never lived, let alone sometimes visited. I handle a lot of projects in the Middle East and very rarely have the opportunity to actually go to those places. And so for that, we need to inform our architectural team to really understand what are the environmental factors of that region. You know, how hot does it get throughout the year? How much radiation can we expect on site? How much rainfall is there? And is there a way to actually, uh, do, do we have to worry about flooding uh, on a given site? Or perhaps in the Middle East, worrying about droughts. How do we harness and utilize as much of the water on site as possible? As we move forward through a project, then we actually want to look at essentially three major studies on every project, or as much as possible. Uh, for any major base building, massing and orientation really matters. So really beginning to look at, through either each of those schemes, you know, how do we best mass the building to take advantage of passive solar gain? Uh, how do we shield it from late afternoon uh, heat gain? Uh, moving forward through that design, looking at the actual optimization of the, of the exterior envelope. What glazing types do we, do we want to use in this building? Does that glazing need to be shaded? Uh, what's the optimal amount of window wall ratio area? And if we're doing looking at natural ventilation, how do you make each of those louvers operable? Which louvers become operable and which ones stay sealed? Uh, moving forward, and actually one of the topics that we probably want to talk about throughout all of this, and this not only applies to architecture but also to interiors as well, is really looking at, at daylighting. Um, it's something you really want to think about very early on and throughout the process really keep asking that question. How much natural daylight are we getting into the space? It saves us money in terms of artificial light loads, but also it's going to save us uh, general comfort for each of the occupants there, which means more people coming to work and staying there much more focused and saving money for the clients in terms of their, their, their actual working habits. And so the next really is then what tools to be used to do this. Uh, for thousands of years, architects have only relied really on a pencil. Uh, but we've constantly developed more focused tools on the best ways to measure out buildings, measure out angles, sinuous curves. But we've always still used the pencil as the uh, common medium. Over the course of the past 25 years, we've started to delve into the uh, computer. And that brings with it uh, a great advantage of being able to essentially streamline a lot of our architectural drafting, but it also complicates it sometimes in the uh, translation of data. Going on to the next slide, you start to begin to look at a, uh, a huge number of new tools that we can use to really analyze our buildings and their response to the, need, to the environment, like many of the things I was saying, but then also looking at whole building energy modeling um, and how when we generate a graphic through SketchUp, do we bring that into some of these various softwares to analyze its lighting gain, its, uh, its, its overall orientation against the sun, uh, you know, possible energy use, uh, its response to heating and the cooling loads, and then move forward and translate that into BIM. And that actually sometimes gets really challenging. And so you're probably one of the biggest obstacles that we have moving forward is that interoperability issue. Uh, because let's go to the next slide. What we don't want to have here is garbage in, garbage out. And that's the real risk that we that we take that if we don't properly understand the way that we can translate between these softwares we often lose a lot of data in, in that translation. And in the same way, we don't always want to just trust these analysis tools to give us information and actually trust it verbatim. Uh, programs like, like, like Ecotech and IEF give us wonderful in, in environmental output, but it still doesn't take away the responsibility of the designer to really understand why those why those results are coming out. It's really inherent that we begin to understand that process. So I'm going on the next, accuracy is really what's key here. We need to make sure that if we want to create a high performance building, that we be the ones that are really guiding forward that process. So what do these studies actually look like? If you go on to the next slide, we'll start once again with energy benchmarking and, and targets. And I like to re refer to this slide as our wine bottle. Uh, what you see here on the far left is the uh, whole building energy use of, of a typical office building as it's broken up into its major loads, lighting, uh, office, office, office equipment, space heating and cooling, fans, pumps, uh, domestic hot water. All that makes up uh, you know, the sort of average amount of energy use for a building in, in, the, in the Los Angeles climate. 
And as we move forward through the design process, we really want to target how can we bring down that energy load low enough that we can maybe actually look at a net zero building. And so looking forward to like where might we really want to cut things down. And here you can sort of start seeing that lighting is an obvious place where we can actually probably rely a lot more on natural daylight. But office, office equipment is something that's going to be much more challenging. So we want to talk to the client about how engagement is going to be extremely important once the building is actually finished. Beyond that, we want to understand how much energy might we be able to generate from renewables on site, such that we actually can can form that net zero uh, that net zero solution that the building is generating as much energy as it uses every year. In order to really understand those targets, we really need to understand what are the actual influences on the site. So moving on to the next, we start to look at, at climate analysis. Uh, what's the annual what's the annual temperature on this site throughout the year? How much rainwater do they get? What's the solar path like at this particular latitude? Do we have to worry about that uh, sort of northwestern heat during the afternoons? And actually, in the in 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 the the in the winter time, is it so cold that we actually want to actually get some passive heat gain from the sun? We can look at wind to get a general understanding of whether or not natural ventilation might be possible, and that we might need to actually mask the building in such a way to optimize the, the wind flow throughout a microclimate. Looking at solar radiation, we can begin to understand if we can incorporate re renewable energy on this site, and then looking at annual, annual humidity to understand how comfortable the air actually is outside. 80 degrees in no and zero zero humidity is actually quite comfortable, but if you drive it up to 100 percent, we all of a sudden feel feel extremely uncomfortable. And in the case of trying to incorporate natural ventilation, we need to figure out a way to pull that moisture out of the air. Moving on next, we look at massing and orientation studies. And this through a, a new software that 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 Autodesk is currently beta testing called Project. Vasari, we're able to 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 get a a glimpse very early on at how much energy a building might use, but more importantly, how as we adjust the building, how energy loads are going to flux in relation in relation to the other schemes. This program gives us some very finite data, and that's actually to be treated with a lot of caution. What you actually want to do is run a series of different tests. What happens if I uh, rotate this building by 90 degrees, well, will my energy load go up or down? If I put shading devices on that western edge or the southwestern edge where I'm getting a lot of, a lot of direct sunlight, what's the actual impact on the energy load of the building? So this very quickly gives us a glimpse at how we can begin to actually shape our architecture to reduce the energy loads that would normally face this building. Moving on to the next slide. We look at envelope optimization. You know, if we want to actually induce natural ventilation, how could we could we utilize a double skin to actually induce the the flow of air across the building and into each of the interior spaces? We'll talk about this one a bit more and how we can actually use computational fluid fluid dynamics to really to really derive a lot of a lot of information about how air moves both on the outside of the building and also within. And moving on next, and this is probably one of the most one of the most important studies we do is that of daylight studies. You know, when do you get the best natural daylight into a space? But also what kind of light are you getting? Natural daylight's great, but heat is really bad. We don't want to get this excessive heat gain when when we're getting light into the space. We also don't want a lot of glare. And so when we design shading devices or light shelves on our buildings, we want to really understand what, what kind of impact that's going to have, and not just to decorate our buildings with these shading studies that seem like they might give us a gain, but we haven't actually gone into the deep dive to understand what it really does. This is all about putting the right amount of money and the right kind of equipment in the right place, optimizing those finalized results. Moving on next. When all this 
comes together, you start to see how we actually then, you know, really penetrate not only the energy and the, and the environmental performance of a building, but we actually really change the, uh, the actual flow and function within that space. If you can bring natural daylight deep into a building, you can actually really open it, open it up a whole lot more. If you were to drive large atria down a uh, large uh, footprint, you, you actually create these new architectural spaces that can be used to gather people around it. So it's not just here an, en an engineering function, but also very much a an architectural one. Moving on to the next slide, when we actually sort of advance that even further, couple that with uh, occupant engagement, renewable energy solutions, we can hopefully drive forward design to actually reach that net zero situation. The image that you see here is a, is a conceptual project of how to retrofit an, an, an existing Los Angeles federal office building. Let's bring it down to net zero by, by, by incorporating a lot of uh, very, very typical solar, solar energy but also wrapping the building in, uh, in, in uh, tubes with algae as a fluid, not only shading the building, but also generating energy uh, for the building's use, and actually pulling in CO2 from the surrounding area, and actually cleaning that air and turning it back into clean oxygen. So it's only when we begin to sort of bring in these elements of pseudoscience that we actually be able to see some of these very ambitious goals push forward. And so next, I'm going to hand off back to uh, Peter. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ecotech and how that can be used to help you drive forward some of those design solutions. All righty. So I'm just going to change gears for a second and move over into Ecotech. Now, for those of you who have never seen this, this is actually a software package that Autodesk uh, purchased a couple years back. And when you're looking to do more thorough environmental analysis, this is one of the tools that you can take advantage of. It has a nice graphic interface, so you can see things either sketchy or hard. And what I'm going to do in here is just do some simple lighting analysis. Now, with this little building that I've got here, one of the first things I can actually do is tell it to display my sun path. So this time, I can actually see where my sun is going to be. And you can see as I move the sun, the shadows on the building are actually changing. And if I need to, I can always move this throughout the entire year as well. And I can actually just sort of run this right through. Now, one of the nice things I can do here is I can also tell this showing me my shadow range. And let me just change one little setup here. There we go. A little easier to read. So if I tell this to show me the range of shadows, Rather than having to run this and kind of eyeball, okay, when I move it from here to here, I can see what's happening with the shadows. This will actually show me what happens throughout the course of the entire day. So if I'm looking for areas that are going to be consistently in shade, or if I'm looking for areas to see, okay, where can I put planting? Because I want to make sure that there's going to be enough light throughout the entire course of the day. This is a very quick, graphic way that I can actually start to get this information. Now, coming from that, let's say I'm trying to find out if I'm going to be getting enough indirect light in an area. And I don't want to actually do a full-on analysis. I want to graphically see this. Because maybe I'm trying to convince the client that it'll actually work. One of the things I can actually do is assign elements here as essentially a reflector. What that, what, what that then tells Ecotech is that, let's see here, I want to actually show rays coming from the direction of the sun so wherever the sun actually is, these rays are going to be coming from. And they're all going to be trying to hit that object. So right now my spacing is about 400 millimeters apart. It's a little bit bigger. It's not quite as busy. And one of the things that you can see here is that all these rays are going straight towards that floor, with the exception of the ones that are hitting the roof. And as I move, down, move the time, I can see how much of this light actually is going directly into that space. Now, coming from that, I mentioned indirect light. So I'm going to change the amount of bounces that I'm telling this to actually do. So as this is coming in, you can actually see the sun's rays hitting that surface that I told it to look for and then bouncing off of that. And then I can tell this to bounce more times, less times, depending on how intricate this design is or what's happening. So if you're looking at, say, a light shelf, 
I can actually see if the light is going to be bouncing off of this correctly based on the angle that is coming in from that time of day, as well as based on the materials. Now, this isn't going to do a full-on analysis and give me the light or the lumens at that source. But this is a really quick, as Sean was alluding to earlier, this is a really quick sprint. I'm just looking to see if my angles are correct. Once I feel comfortable with that portion of it, then I would start taking this a little bit deeper and actually doing real analysis when I start to actually look at things either on a grid or a surface, and I run a full-on setup to try to find what's actually happening at that point in time. So and these are the things that I can start to go and look at a lot deeper, depending on what my needs are at that point in time of the project. <clears throat> So if I wanted to do a really quick one, to say display analysis, set the grid up to be where I need that to be, set that up at the correct elevation, and then I would actually just run the analysis. And again, as Sean was alluding to earlier, depending on the level of analysis, how much detail do I need, I can actually run through everything and set this up. So I'm going to set, set this up for pretty low precision, keep this very quick. And that'll run through. And depending on what I'm asking for for output, I'll see that like this big bubble here. Or I can actually see this a little bit more simplistic. So I don't want to see it in 3D. I just want to see it with colors. I can tell it to show me where my average values are. I can actually get the individual data at those points. And I can see contour lines to make this a little bit more understandable in terms of less grid-like. It just depends on what I'm looking for, whether it's internally reflected, so I have a lot of glazing here, or externally reflected. So tying back to the actual rays that I just designed and put in there, I can actually look at the reflections much higher level of detail than just saying, does that bounce hit this element and go in the space? Again, just depends on what kind of information you're looking for at that point in the design process. Good. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sean. And in a couple of minutes, we're going to go back and look at another piece of software. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, going into uh, the first case, the first case study, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Washington, Washington D.C. consolidated forensics lab. Um, as I was sort of playfully mentioning earlier, this is a D.C. CSI. Um, so this is going to be the new home for both the uh, Metro Metro police department, as well as a full morgue. Uh, some of the other functions in this building, very amazingly enough, there's actually a, about a 150 feet deep shooting range, I think up on the uh, sixth or seventh floor, uh, which you know really allows them to actually test out some of the, uh, some of the actual, the actual ballistics from some of the crimes that, that are happening with the various functions of this building, part office, part laboratory, part, uh, you know, uh, uh, federal police department, we really need to, you know, make sure to create a, both a highly flexible space. We also need to fit all of this into a very small area, uh, which meant that we really need to target uh, a pretty high reduction in the energy load of the building. So when we thought about developing the architecture for this, we really wanted to locate as much as possible the offices along that southern edge of the building where you're right now seeing this uh, essentially a, a very high glazing area. We really block off the east and west edge of the building, only allowing a little bit of uh, punched openings, and actually placing the labs on the north side of the buildings. Uh, labs are obviously places that are much more light sensitive areas where we want to get uh, a good amount of diffuse light into the space, but where we will really want to, you know, ultimately control how much light comes in. Uh, for the south side of the building, though, obviously a lot of glazing means a lot of daylight, but it also means a lot of heat gain. So we wanted to develop a means by which we could uh, mitigate some of that. Let's so move on to the next slide. Talk a little bit about the uh, building as a whole. It's about 350,000 square feet, so about six floors, six six floors above grade and two below. Um, by actually doing some of the uh, various 
high performance issues that, that we dealt with on this project, we're actually gonna be able to save money here, which is a kind of surprising actually to us in, 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 in the long term. Where we actually, this is one of our first pr projects that has really fully tackled uh, BIM, and um, we got this to push forward uh, a lot to actually save us about $25 million on a $220 million project. Um, and I think actually it's currently going down even further than that. Throughout construction, we've made some additional savings, some changes, of course, throughout it. And we're actually going to be finding it's now going from that $220 million budget now down to only about $145 million. So actually a little bit more than a quarter saved. The original goal for this project was only that of lead silver. Um, it was actually by working with our engineering partners over at Vanderweil and really pushing forward the energy performance of this building that we're now actually tracking lead gold and we're actually just shy about two or three points from lead platinum. So we're actually still holding out a little bit of hope that we'll actually uh, be able to get that by, by by the time we finish finish calculating everything out. Going on, the, on to the next line, we start to look at the uh, southern face of this building. And what we're looking here on the far right, you're actually seeing a uh, sort of very open six-story atrium. Actually, it uh, has some uh, vents on the top side, such that actually uh, as we uh, sort of push air across it, as the sun is beating down on it, it's actually going to, going to induce the flow of air inside that space up and out. So we can actually passively heat that space in the wintertime, and actually during the summertime, kind of leave it as open as possible, uh, constantly allowing this air to sort of rush through it, and actually leaving that as a largely untreated space. In the area to the left, you're actually seeing uh, what's going to be uh, a very dynamic shading system. And this became one of the really interesting things that we wanted to look at was that, you know, how do we best, you know, bring out the optimal levels for natural daylight in this space? We obviously wanted to get light deep into the offices. But we also want, really wanted to mitigate some of the major, major, major heat gain impacts. So moving on to the next slide, we started looking at about three different schemes of how some of uh, a few different systems could actually work. Uh, the first one, really looking at very fixed sunshades, uh, which you would typically see, otherwise known as Brie Soleil, uh, to lay that out uh, right at the edge of the, uh, of the clear story, uh, shading uh, the sort of, you know, uh, five feet of glass that goes from sill to just above your own head height, and then uh, putting light shelves in that space, allowing light to have a, a deeper balance into the space. Uh, the offices are uh, fully, fully equipped with, with with chilled beams, it gives us a lot more area for actual for for actual head height. For any of you that work in Washington, Washington D.C., you know that we have pretty uh, fixed floor to uh, ceiling uh, ratios due to the height restrictions. So really, being able to open up the uh, ceiling a bit more through uh, chilled beams gave us an extra foot per every floor, and actually maybe a little bit above that. Uh, but we also want to understand how air was going to move across us. Moving on to the next slide started to look at what some of the major wind patterns would be on this site and how they were going to flow across the building on its own. Um, and any sort of, you know, sort of dense building, you start to see here, uh, looking at the uh, far right, how air moves, how air is going to move move across this building. The sections that you're seeing in blue, the essentially extremely low speed, areas in red, essentially medium and yellow high, high air. Washington DC, we're, we're getting a lot of air on the site, you know, maybe about, you know, typically between six and eight miles per hour from the south, sort of circulating from southwest, southeast. Um, so we're going to get some acceleration of air over the uh, parapet, not enough that we could actually think about putting in any wind turbines. And we're actually seeing that the air here is actually going to be pretty static, which during the summertime against a glass, uh, a fully glazed wall, it's going to create a really bad scenario where not only are we going to be uh, inducing a lot of heat gain through that glazing, but if the air is static as well, it means that air is just going to be hang, hanging around there. The more that it's static, the more that that that, that air is going to uh, actually increase in temperature as the windows re reflect heat back out back out to the air. We're actually only worsening the environment uh, the the environment around the building. The next situation we wanted to look at was what would, what would happen if we put in a series of operable louvers? essentially tracking the sunlight throughout the day and actually dynamically responding uh, to the, the actual solar angle. This meant that we could reflect out most of the uh, heavy uh, heat gains and some of, the, some, of the, some of the intense UV 
radiation. We'd still get in most of the natural daylight that we want, but we wouldn't have to deal with as much heat gain. The next thing that we thought about was, you know, what would happen to the air in this case? You know, we thinking that if you put in somewhat of a uh, buffer facade, essentially a semi-open second skin, that air would begin to move a bit faster throughout this space. Moving on to the next slide, we then tested that once again through CFD modeling. All this, by the way, was run through Ecotect with Winner 4 as a, a side, as a, as a side plugin. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a little bit more movement than what we saw in, in, in the last one. Not a tremendous amount of airflow, but what you start seeing, especially in the upper right diagram here, that area in red there is where we start seeing air to begin to actually move through. Where that before had been extremely static, we're now actually seeing a, a lot of air movement on the outside edge of the building. And looking in, into the lower right, really actually seeing that air is actually going to be drawn down and then through this skin which means we're going to be constantly moving air across it. Not really fast, but we're not going to be having the static air that's extremely hot hovering around us. Once again, with the operable louvers constantly adjusting to, to the light angles, we're going to be blocking out a lot of those UV rays and really bringing down our overall energy load. The uh, third scheme that we looked at here kind of maxes it out. What if, in addition to those operable louvers, we actually added a full double skin? A sealed glazing wall that actually that actually forms an exit and an extra solid buffer against this building. Um, so once again, this is where you can actually um, essentially seal it during during the winter time, allowing uh, essentially passive heat gain in it to bring into the space, reducing some of our, our our heating load. And then during the summertime, actually, that we could open up that that top portion of the uh, double skin essentially allow the air to then pass through and breathe throughout. And then the question really became, well, what if during the spring and fall we can actually bring in some of that air when it's the optimal temperature outside to what we actually want to feel inside? Could we actually induce enough airflow that we could bring air into the space? So moving on to the next slide, this is when we started seeing some really major results. Um, that as you close off that skin, you actually create this negative pressure on the inside portion of the face and a very positive pressure on the outside as wind is blowing over it. So looking at that lower right diagram, again, you start to see a whole lot more air. It's very quickly flowing down and really being drawn into that buffer. And it accelerates actually extremely quickly, extremely, extremely quickly in excess of 10 to 15 miles per hour throughout that skin. What that means is that if we wanted to, we could actually introduce vents uh, below the sills of each of the uh, windows to actually pull in some of the air. It could still be filtered, it could still actually be clean air coming into that space and then flowing throughout the office. And this means that we're not having to rely on any cooling loads that we would normally get sort of in late spring or early fall, eliminating some of the heating loads in the sort of really early spring and really late fall. And then, you know, hopefully creating a condition as well that means we don't need to rely on nearly as much fan power. So really drastically reducing our energy loads here, still creating the natural daylight situation that, that, that we want. And all this was actually done in a very short period of time, allowed us to analyze each of these schemes. Um, moving on to the next slide, one real, you know, major issue comes about is cost feasibility. Obviously, adding uh, three skins on a uh, south side of a building gets pretty expensive. So we scrapped that one. Um, for other reasons as well, the DC uh, laboratory didn't actually want natural ventilation into that building because of the obviously sensitive nature of a lot of the work they do. They actually didn't want to take the risk of any toxins coming in, even with the added filters that we could do to bring in natural air. That being said, this would be a very feasible situation for a more normal office building. If you look at the uh, Genzyme building up in Boston, you see a very similar case of where, where, of where that's being done, and actually drawing air into it. In the end, we actually went with the buffer facade. And the way that you see it working here, you can see that uh, in days when it's uh, you know, hot summer days with, with sun overhead, the uh, light is able to, to, actually, to actually track it over. Uh, as it gets lower in the afternoon, those sh shading devices really fully close. We've added about 50% frit to that glazing. So not only is the glass itself 
blocking out some of that light, but the fruit is actually adding to the reflection of light throughout. Uh, when it's closed like that, we actually are able to then induce some of that airflow. We're not actually going to bring air into the building, but obviously during the summertime when it's most hot out, we can actually fully close that, that exterior louver and really then induce air pretty quickly throughout the building. And again, actually what's interesting, one of the major concerns if you have to put any operable, operable equipment on the outside of any building, obviously what happens if it snows, what, what happens if it's freezing rain. And the nice thing is that the sensors on this building uh, very quickly track the sun and also track the weather patterns. So if it starts raining, it's going to fully close, meaning that we're not going to have any excess collection of uh, snowfall on those shelves and that anything can be very, can be very quickly shut off the building. Uh, if you go to the next slide and start seeing just a really quick animation, if Peter, you just want to go ahead and tap through those a bit quickly. You can see how those louvers begin to move as sun tracks throughout the day. And then moving on to that slide, and you start seeing now the actual installation of that, of that glazing uh, in the building itself. We're about, uh, say about nine tenths through uh, construction. We're actually expecting uh, occupants to enter sometime in August. And all of this, once again, is on a hydraulic system. So the only, so the only electric load going to managing the movement of those uh, shishane devices is that of the sundial on the roof, just knowing whether or not to open or close those lifts. So. Had we had the software early enough, we actually probably would have looked at Vosari a bit earlier on to really understand that energy impact. In the end, we couldn't really test that out until we went into the whole building energy modeling. And I'm going to allow Peter here now to come in and talk about just a, an example case study for Washington, D.C. and how that might function using that software. All right. So I'm going to bounce over into another program again. And what I'm looking at here is actually a site in Washington, D.C. So you can see basically a little bit of a plan or a photo of the actual site that's taken directly from Google Earth through the actual software that I'm in right now, which is Project Versari. This is actually a free program that you can download from Autodesk Labs. So if you go to labs.autodesk.com, you can get it from there. And I've actually built up these little gray buildings as sort of my existing conditions on the site. I have a little white building here, that's actually sort of like my project right now. And one of the things I already placed on here was just the wind rows, just to give me an idea of where my wind directions are going to be. This is something I actually can customize both the size and the information of. Now, what I'm going to do here is take my little building, and I want to do some solar radiation studies on it. So I figure I've got a lot of buildings around it. You know, am I going to be getting shades because of them, or do I have to worry about, you know, full sun? So I'll click on my solar radiation. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. So I'm going to actually open this up one more time. So what should happen is when I click on that button, this opens up. There we go. As Peter's loading this up, it's actually worth to say, so for those of you who haven't, who haven't tried out this software, it's basically Revit, but, extre but extremely pared down. Essentially, it's almost like a, a SketchUp version of Revit, allowing for you to do a lot of pretty free-flowing massing and orientation, and then to run some of these analysis, some of these, some of these, uh, some of these analyses. It's pretty great. I just made a really quick form here just to take advantage of. And what I'm going to end up doing here is do that solar radiation that I was just mentioning. So I'm going to come over here, tell it that I want to do this. And what it's looking for me to do is actually tell it what faces do I care about, because maybe I only am concerned with certain locations. I'll literally click on those surfaces. Once I'm done, I click again. And this will actually run through and analyze this. Now, this is doing this based on the location of the project and the actual time of day. And also, if I set up a difference between sort of my project north and true north, it does take that into consideration. So as I move this around, you'll actually see the lighting and the information change. If I want to see this in more of a grid function, so it makes it a little bit easier for me to read, I can actually change it to do that. Now, 
all this information is controllable. I can ask, do I want this to be in watt hours, kilowatt, BTUs? Am I looking for a cumulative average or peak? And this is information that I can basically tell this to do as I change. Or if I have a much more complex project that, you know, if my computer's running really slow, I can tell this to only update this when I ask for it. And I can tell this to have high resolution, in which case these little grids get smaller, or a lower resolution for early on quick studies, where it's looking at much more sparse environments. <laughs> so it just depends on what kind of information, again, and what level of my design I'm actually considering the information for. Now, this is one thing that I can actually take a look at, and also I can output this information. If what I'm looking to do is get a little bit more of a detailed analysis of not just the solar on the surface, but I really want to know what happens with this little building or this design over the maybe the life cycle of that building. So what I can do is come over here and take a look at my settings for it. I can say that, okay, the building type is an office. The ground plane would be at, say, level one. And I tell it the specific location within the world. That information is important so it understands where it might be getting cost information for local energy and also wind and environmental patterns. I can give it a space tolerance for certain things. And I tell it to create an energy model of this object based on things like, what is my conceptual idea of the materials? Because again, this is just one big box. I'm saying that for the walls that will be considered interior and exterior, use that kind of a wall. Does it have insulation? Does it not have insulation? I'm making some very big general decisions. I'm making decisions on the overall size of the building, the glazing, and what kind of HVAC system it might have. What this is going to allow me to do is get an idea of what this will actually do. So this is my 40% glazing. And then I can tell it that I actually want this to run this analysis. So at this point, it essentially uploads all this information to the cloud. And then it actually will, will create this analysis and then spit the results back out to me. Now, the nice thing about this is, what happens if I want to make a quick change to this? Let's see what happens if I take the building and rotate it by 15 degrees. What happens if I say I'm going to raise the amount of glazing on the building? But what happens if I put shading devices over top of that? Does it mitigate now the amount of glass that I've added to the building? So these things I can run, and then I can actually compare and contrast the results each time. So by creating this thing, I can go to my results and compare, and I can actually see what's happening with my project. So these ones are previous ones that I've already done. The one that I've just sent up is about 35% finished. But while I wait for that one, I can actually look at a preview. So this will show me what the, uh, the design looks like. It reminds me, what is the actual location? What's the weather station if I want to confirm their data? My complete square footage, the exterior wall and glazing area. So this is the kind of information that I can actually get out of a very early on quick run of some analysis information. So if I do this and it informs me that, OK, based on what you're looking at, you know, you're going to be spending way too much energy on this. OK, well, let me make some changes and we run this and see how that actually impacts my overall design. So again, just running through. Some of this information is not really analyzed. It's just telling me what's happening based on the location that my project is in. So I can use this to help me inform my design. And the one that I sent up before is almost done. So something relatively simple. You can see how fast this is. This is at 82% already. So within a couple of minutes, you can say, go get coffee, come back, and it might actually be done. <coughs> and when it actually does finish, you'll actually get a little pop-up window telling you it is finished if you weren't already in this. So it'll actually let you know and alert you. So I could actually be over here keeping, you know, getting more work done, just waiting for this to pop up and tell me. And then once that happens, so it tells me it's ready. I can then export this email the information to somebody. So maybe I want to email this to the head designer if I'm not that person. I can also email this to my HVAC designer and say, OK, this is what I'm looking at. What do you think? So within just a couple of minutes, I can make a quick form, put some data in, 
and get an idea of what I'm looking at. And one of the other things that Sean was actually showing, let me open that back up, was the ability to actually do analysis for CFD, for computational fluid dyna uh, dynamics. Now, this is technically, let's see here, technically more in research. So, like you said before, you take things here with a grain of salt. But that wind rose that I had on the ground, that wasn't there just for me to look at and say, okay, well, I think that's where it comes from. I can also utilize that to get a quick idea of what's happening with the wind in this area. So do I have low pressure zones, high pressure zones? If I'm trying to see, well, is the building going to impact the directionality of the wind for things, say, like a turbine or other information? And again, this is all completely free. And I can get more information in here depending on what I'm trying to display, whether it's air pressure, velocity, do I want to see the analysis in 3D? Do I want to actually see little arrows pointing where the analysis is coming from and where things are going? So it really just depends on how I want to actually read this information. And again, it mentions that these results are experimental and have yet to be fully validated. Yeah, this is one of the things where I always, more than anything else with this tool, I, I definitely recommend looking at this, you know, with with definite interest, but with a bit of skepticism. You can look at this to understand what's the general means of airflow across a massing or surface, but to understand that obviously wind never comes from a solid direction at a solid pace. It's constantly fluid and moving. And so what you're seeing here is really a very static situation for that. Um, and so until they accelerate that more to understand more of the complexity of, you know, general air movement, I wouldn't try to, you know, I wouldn't shape your building, you know, excessively to, you know, mimic some of this data. You also want to make sure that you have the right wind air information. What's it like at that microclimate? Obviously, most of the weather and wind data that we get comes from airports. So if you're working in downtown Manhattan and Newark, New Jersey is your closest weather station, you're obviously going to be seeing a very different wind pattern over that very open field versus the very dense urban environment. So really try to understand this information for what it is and not extrapolate it uh, too far. So I'm going to hand this back over to Sean now. Back to me. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. What else, what else do I have to say? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. But one of the last things that we wanted to show is just a little bit of where things are going. Uh, when you have projects like what we've just shown, all of them were new. So it's very easy to say, okay, as part of the design, we're going to make a quick mass and study it and look at where things are. But with a lot of the projects that are going to be coming forward, and one of the things that people like to talk about is the GSA. They own a lot of buildings, and they're trying to get those to be much more energy efficient. If you have something that is existing, there's ways that I can very quickly get a three-dimensional model from that. And it's not just a cool thing, or it's not something that I'm only going to be using for design. I can actually take advantage of that for analysis. So this is actually a tool from Autodesk uh, called 123D Catch. Again, another free program. What this does is it takes a large amount of photographs and using math and something called photometry, what it actually does is create a three-dimensional model that you can then utilize to actually do what you need with it. Whether that is doing that little bridge before or a site here, you're actually building something based on nothing more than a whole lot of photographs. And then you can use that for actual analysis or modeling. And that little screenshot that we showed before in the PowerPoint is this. This is actually a Microsoft Connect. So most of you might know this if it's hooked up to your TV in your living room and then hooked up to your Xbox. What that actually is is a very powerful little scanner. And what the guys at MIT did was they hooked that up to an autonomous helicopter and used that to scan an entire department in one of their buildings. So using that, you get a point cloud. That point cloud can then be brought into Revit. That model in Revit can then be used for analysis, design, whatever. So it's one of the things where this is sort of where things are going to end up. It's still more cutting edge than, you know, availability, but this isn't that far away. You know, people are already utilizing this and looking at this, and that's pretty much automatic. And looking at other options where you have to run around and take a whole lot of photographs or you have a little helicopter that takes them for you, 
there's ways of doing that with a handheld unit. So you can actually hold that there, and it'll create the 3D model. Or there's ways of hooking this up to an airplane for an entire site. And that airplane could also run on GPS. So there's a couple of different things that we can take advantage of in terms of creating the models that we need to run this kind of analysis. So if it's the thing where it's like, well, you know, you know, I don't do new buildings, so this doesn't really work for me. Or I do buildings, but a lot of the analysis I do needs to have context. It needs a site model that has the surrounding buildings to really understand how they react. There's a lot of tools out there that will help you take advantage of what's surround, so that way you can do the analysis that really will inform your design. And these are just a couple of the examples. So with that, we've been keeping an eye, but there haven't been any questions that have been uh, typed into the little question window. Does anybody have any that uh, we'd be glad to answer as many as we can? Peter, while we're waiting to see if we've got any questions coming in, I'll just say, you know, thank you and, and thank you, Sean. This has um, been a really great session and a lot of great things to say. I know we're coming to the top of the hour, so um, if there are any questions that are coming in, we can answer a couple of them, and then we'll take anything else that comes in uh, offline so we can let everybody go. But um, in the meantime, I do also want to let everybody know about um, a couple more resources and places you can go for information. So um, certainly up on our website, you can find some links to more information about training classes and other training and consulting solutions, free webinars every Friday, um, as well as uh, lots of other great information. We'll also include a recording of this session. Uh, we have recordings of all of our other sessions. And then if you're interested specifically in learning more about this topic, we encourage you to check out our new one-day training class called Green BIM Fundamentals. And that will give you a chance to dive into many more of the topics discussed today and beyond. A really great class. You can check it out on microdesk.com slash course catalog. All right, so if we don't have any questions, we will uh, close it up. And I want to thank everyone for your time today. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.